The Joint Finance Appropriations Committee passed another Medicaid budget on Thursday after the first failed on the House floor on Monday. This budget appropriates $4.5 billion, including $3 billion of federal funds, and needs approval from both chambers before making it to the governor's desk. Another Idaho Department of Health and Welfare issue made headlines this week. The department is asking a district court to stop an attorney general investigation into how the department awarded community partner grants meant to go to programs that serve children between the ages of 5 to 13 to help with issues like learning loss and behavioral health. In March, Attorney General Raul Labrador requested information from those grant recipients on how they spent the funds, specifically looking to see if any of the organizations used the funds for children younger than five years old. Labrador also requested information from Health and Welfare Director Dave Jepson, plus two other department employees. On Thursday, Jepson filed a petition to stop the investigation, saying the Attorney General doesn't have the statutory authority for the investigation. The department also pointed to two letters from a deputy attorney general saying the department could award grants to programs that serve children younger than five as long as they also serve school age children. Idaho Reports has since learned that the Joint Budget Committee co-chairs alerted Labrador's office to the potential issues with the grants. The department maintains that it awarded those grants legally. It's a complex story and we have much more online, but joining me to discuss the political implications of this fight are Kevin Richard of Idaho Education News and Dr. Jacqueline Kettler of Boise State University School of Public Service. Dr. Kettler, this isn't the first time that an AG has been at odds with with other people in state government, whether in Idaho or elsewhere. But how often do these fights, do these tensions become public like this? I think this is a fairly unusual case. Sometimes we'll see high profile conflicts when there's a partisan split, right? The governor and the uh, attorney general are elected from different parties. But this is a, a fairly different situation. And I think it is really interesting, the conflict, right? That it does put um, both perhaps the attorney general office, but also health and welfare as trying to figure out, okay, how do we pursue, how, or how do we proceed in this situation? Do you think there may be any policy or, or uh, functioning government implications um, depending on how this plays out? For sure. I mean, first of all, they're just like kind of trust in how, how the executive branch is operating, right? And how actors within the executive branch are cooperating and engaging, especially when the attorney general office is that legal representation in most situations for agencies. And now you have, um, you know, health and welfare needing most likely, I assume, pursuing private or outside counsel in this situation. So these tensions can play a role down the road as well, in addition to this, this current debate. Uh, and, and that's so interesting. That you, so, so yes, the department did get outside counsel and ultimately we can assume that taxpayers will, will uh, pay for that. But you say trust in government and you know, already I've seen responses to the story that there are some people who are pointing fingers at the Department of Health and Welfare and other people who are pointing fingers at the Attorney General's office. Uh, it, it almost seems like it's confirming positions that people may have already had. Right, I think I think that is right, and I mean, there's been some debates. I mean, for several years about health and welfare, kind of some of the the different policy actions or, or mechanisms there. But also now we have a new attorney general, and kind of how that office is going to operate and run, and what is within the bounds of that office and what is not, will be kind of questions for moving forward. And Kevin, this debate uh, stems from a 2021 legislative mm -hmm. fight that involves pre-K education and whether or not the state government can fund it. Right, this adds a whole new layer of political intrigue and political uh, political implications to a long-standing fight at the state house about whether the state has a role or should take a role in pre-K. Whether there's a you know, a role in the st you know, in, that the state should play in funding pre-K or is the state's education role strictly K-12. And that was, you know, in, in 2021, you and I both sat through debates where the only way they could get that community grant program passed was if they guaranteed that the money wouldn't go to, as, as a, a roundabout way of funding pre-K. Right, exactly. This, like I say, this has been a fight and it goes back well beyond 2021. There have been attempts to fund pre-K at the state level that have really gone nowhere. So we have plenty of education debates that are 
new for just this week. I want to ask you, uh, first of all, uh, for an update on school choice legislation, we already know that uh, we've seen a number of proposals die. There was a, a proposal that looped in the Empowering Parents grant program. What's the latest on that? Well, it looks like it's kind of fizzled out. Uh, it, the bill was supposed to have a hearing in the House Education Committee on Wednesday. It was pulled off of the agenda Tuesday evening. But basically, there wasn't the support in the House Education Committee to get that bill out of committee and onto the House floor. And that was the leading school choice legislation of the session. It was probably the last bill standing. And with it fizzling out in House Education, the issue appears to be dead for 2023, but we're certainly going to see this issue resurface in 2024. The debate continue in 2024, which is a, a, an election year for 105 legislators. Well, and, and this is a bill that passed a, a Senate that was skeptical on other school choice proposals. And a split Senate in and of itself. I mean, this bill passed the Senate on a 1915 vote. There were several Republicans who changed their votes. They, they voted against the far more aggressive and extensive universal education savings account bill that, that failed on the Senate floor. This passed, didn't pass by much, but the changes in the bill and the scope of the bill obviously were not enough to sway skeptics on the House Education Committee. Well, let's talk education budget, starting with the higher education budgets. Uh, community colleges are rarely controversial in the legislature, but it's usually those four-year institutions Boise State, University of Idaho, ISU, and LCSC that that find the sticking points. It was more or less the kind of debate that you would expect on a higher education budget. It was more or less the debate we've heard on higher education budgets in past years. Really not a whole lot of discussion about the dollar figures themselves, but about diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, all of those buzz for, buzzwords emerged in the debate. Ultimately, the bill did pass uh, 41 to 28, it's on its way to the governor's desk, and it's more or less the budget that Governor Little wanted in the first place. So I would, would imagine that uh, it'll get uh, assigned into law, but it sets the stage again. Here's another debate that we're almost certainly gonna see resurface in 2024. I, I thought one of the interesting things we heard in the debate on the House floor on Thursday evening, Representative Wendy Horman, the co-chair of the uh, Joint Finance Appropriations Committee said, we've done about as much as we can with the budget. If you really want to address DEI, if you really want to address uh, social justice, what you really ought to do, colleagues, is write a policy bill that bans DEI and social justice spending on public uh, campuses, as has taken place in other states. So you could almost you could almost hear the wheels turning. I mean, this is almost certainly going to be a, a bill that somebody presents in 2024. I mean, we haven't even put the 2023 session to bed, and we're talking about issues that uh, are gonna make the 2024 session pretty fascinating. Don't jinx us, because we haven't adjourned yet. <laughs> we still I'm have some committee meetings next week. We haven't put the 2023 week. session to bed yet. <laughs> There's still time. Uh, how about the K through 12 public education budget? We passed the joint budget committee. We haven't heard it on the floor yet. Hasn't come up in either house. Uh, but we know that they're coming back next week. I would imagine that's going to come up pretty quickly. I don't envision much, uh, many sticking points on the K-12 budgets, but who knows? We've been surprised before, certainly, yeah, by that yes, K-12 absolutely. budget. Uh, you know, we have about a minute and a half left. I wanna ask you for an update on that Idaho launch program. That also appears to be well on its way to the governor's office. Uh, the Senate took them a while. It took two hours for them to pass the two Idaho launch bills, and it gets complicated because the one basically fixes and changes and tweaks a lot of things in the original bill. That bill is on its way to the governor. The original bill is on the governor's desk or on its way. The follow-up bill, the trailer bill, that came out of House committee on Friday. I would imagine that the House takes that up, you know, maybe as early as Tuesday when they come back into session. So it looks for all intents and purposes, like this uh, program is on its way to the governor's desk. And as a reminder, the Idaho Launch Program, is an, it's an expansion of an existing program, and it would give uh, give grants to right. graduating high school seniors for uh, workforce training. Up to $8,000 for community college or workforce training, right. And what is the trailer bill, what does the companion bill fix or change, rather? What it does, uh, it does a lot of things, but one of the things that it does is it kind of limits the amount of money a high school graduate can get, it, it reduces it to $8,000, requires that student to put 20% of uh, 
cover 20% of their costs, among other things, but those are the two biggies that would affect students. Okay, fantastic. Kevin Richard of Idaho Education News. We'll see you back at the State House next week. Lucky yeah, you. I'll be there all week. <laughs> and Dr. Jacqueline Kettler from Boise State University School of Public Service. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for watching again. We have so much more online. Go to IdahoPTV.org slash Idaho Reports. You'll find it all there. We'll see you next week.